Thanks for joining me this, ever, this evening, everyone, for the introduction to street photography presentation. Um, I know there's a little ditty right there, but uh, in, that's a base, basic definition of street photography, but photography in public places, does anybody else have a, any other definitions that they wanna share? See, I'm, an, I'm an interactive guy if you wanna tell me what street photography means to you if anybody wants to jump in. If not, I'll go on to the next screen. Street photography is also historical photography in a sense. And who's, who's that speaking? Uh, Jim Rzakowski. Hi, Jim. Hi. That's, that's right. It can be historical, whether it's uh, your basic, your general street photography or documentary photography. They can both be historical in a way, even though uh, oh, we'll get to that. Documentary photography is usually about an event that's going on, but heck, you know, your regular street photography may have buildings in the background that are later torn down and so forth. So it becomes historical in that sense. Okay, let's see if I can scroll down here. Let's see this, move everybody's picture to the other side. All right, that's that picture I entered in last month's competition with the neat reflection, but a further definition is street photography is a genre of photography that records everyday life in a public place. The very publicness of the setting enables a photographer to take candid pictures of strangers, often without their knowledge, if you're not around hyper aware people. I had a funny story, I, had a, I was in the short north at nine o'clock at night and it was dark and I was in a shadow across the street and took a picture of a guy with his girlfriend and a nice backdrop and I looked at the picture later and the guy was sticking his tongue out at me when I developed it. He saw me in the dark from across the street. So sometimes you, you don't get away with it. They, they see you anyway. Here's a, another definition. Street photography is about documenting everyday life and society. The most important thing in street photography is to capture emotion, humanity, and soul by Eric Kim. I took, I thought that guy was interesting with the COVID mask over his trumpet to be respectful for everybody that was walking by and uh, not getting his germs on people. So that was nice. Uh, according to Joel Meyerwitz, that we'll talk about again in a minute, he's on the street, each successive wave of people brings a whole new cast of characters. If you keep paying attention, something will re reveal itself in just a split second. A crazy cockeyed picture. Um, this was 11 o'clock at night in the short north, and I thought I'd take a shot at putting my camera at my Fuji X-T2 and shutter speed priority at 1 60th of a second and panning this guy, you got like a, I would guess like a 20% chance of moving your camera from left to right in the same speed that guy's going and catch him in focus. And I got lucky enough to get him in reasonable focus on that one. But is he like sitting it. on Richard? He's got a ice skates down there. It looks 11 oh, o'clock okay. at night, hockey jersey. Uh, maybe a Chicago black, black hots on, hat on backwards and his goggles so bugs don't get in his eyes in the summer. But uh, I don't know, just a unusual looking character at 11 o'clock at night. Was that one shot, Richard? Just your one shot you took of it? Oh, no. I had that on uh, eight frames a second. I got about three frames in front of that that were not that great in focus, this one. And then I took a couple more frames after that were out of focus again, but got the got the one in the middle and the just the right timing. I'm not that good one one shot and done. Uh, there's an emerging popular artistic style of street photography that nobody 
<laughs> defines it this way, but it's just uh, more, I would call it more fine art. It uses architecture, light and shadows, shapes and silhouettes. Seems to me the people in the photograph are secondary to the artistic nature of the photograph. And gosh, if you want to do street photography and they publish it on uh, Lens Culture Streets, SPI Collective, all those places, you have to have a crazy artistic rendition. They just don't take humanity and soul and ordinary people on the street. It has to be something really fine art looking. And this is one I picked out. I didn't take take this, just a few examples. I think this is a better example here. To me, the light and the shadows and shapes are the primary part of the photograph and the, the person in it is kind of secondary. So, you know, the traditional street photography, it's the story of a human doing something. And to me, this is not really a story of a human doing something. It's just more about the architecture, shapes and light. I don't know, here, uh, more of a fine art picture of the mannequins with sunglasses and the person's reflection also has a sunglasses. Uh, they're out of focus, but you'll find a lot of times they still pick uh, photos. If the person's a little out of focus and stuff, they don't care. It's the overall impression of the photograph. And, you know, this to me, I don't know if this fits the traditional shows humanity, soul, and the story of a person. I guess you could say it's a story of, give it a stretch, aloneness in the world, just a little person and a big, big shadow and all that. So that's a story of a guy in an airplane wing. Kind of looks like it, doesn't it? You got creative imagination there, Mark. Ah, uh, this is one one I took during the protests in the short north in the rain, and uh, it's like f two point eight at like sixty four hundred ISO at like eight o'clock at night just to get enough light on him. But I didn't I didn't notice if Kent Larson was here, but you know he said to me, "Well, you can't see his face. You know, it's not a good, you know." He didn't say it's not a good photo. He goes, but couldn't you fill in the shadow on the guy's face? And in street photography, it, they don't care about whether you can see his face or not. It's a, like the overall impression. And it's it's just, uh, I think I titled this uh, something about love for a black man as after the George Floyd uh, incident and so forth. So, um just a lot of good backgrounds with all that painting of uh, painting in the short nord after that. I won't, I posted something, a different, different one about protest art and, you know, I said, this is not a commentary on the uh, protests and that kind of thing. And I've never seen, there was like 300 comments and people were arguing about the protest for about a month after I posted the photo. So, wow, it's uh, really invoked a lot of emotions. But uh, street photography, I think we had just had that mentioned at the beginning of street photography versus documentary photography. Uh, documentary photo photographers typically have a defined message with intent to define particular events in history. So, old uh, Mr. Wood called me up one Saturday morning and said, you want to go photograph the, the protest? So we did, and we stayed until it started getting uh, the pressure, pressure of the uh, situation of people versus the police. You could hear it and feel it building and so forth, but uh, just, you know, that's a picture of a documentary uh, photography. It just historical historical event after that happened. Uh, this is the Columbus police in a face-off with the protesters and 
I think we stayed about 20 more minutes after that because it started getting dicey. Uh, conversely, street photography is reactive and allowing it to deliver a more neutral depiction of the world that mirrors society, unmanipulated and usually unaware subjects. This is actually two people with all they own on their backs walking across the railroad tracks there uh, in Columbus. And, and street photography, you know, versus street portraits. And I, there's kind of a little joke in there. They're unposed and candid and they don't know that you're taking their picture even though this young lady is, is posing, but not for me. I think she did a pretty good job of mimicking Arnold there. And it's just a candid guy, candid picture of a guy taking a smoke, you can see in his left hand and he was blew out his smoke and I don't know how. It's a hat trick, that's all I can say is that you can't see the smoke in front of his face and it looks like the smoke is coming out of his hat or his brain or something. Just sometimes weird, hap weird things happen that you can't explain. Yeah, I used this in competition a couple of year ago, years ago. Um, you know, just shows people are doing their thing and don't notice that you're taking their photograph. And street portraits are classified as portraits taken of strangers in the moment while they're out, while you're out doing street photography. They are seen as posed as there's interaction with the subjects, subject or subjects. Here, these, uh, these dudes actually asked me to take their photo and they said, looks like a nice camera. Would, could you take a photo and then hit us up on Instagram? I think a couple of them were visiting from out of town. So I was glad to do it. And it's a cute picture of these guys. And I asked this couple to take their picture. I thought it was interesting when she had the the doggy earmuffs on and the glasses and they had the headbands and the she had the leather jacket on. Just, I don't know, just look for interesting people. But I really, uh, I don't know, this guy in New York that's next asked me to take his picture and I, I hesitated, but I went ahead and took his picture. That's Mr. Mr. Richard Wood taking a bite out of the big big apple and enjoying his soft pretzel. He was nice nice enough to uh, be our tour guide in New York, and that was on my bucket list. And used to live across the river in New Jersey, working for a corporation for three years, and wasn't into street photography then, and. Uh, well, I could kick myself. I could have gone over there. How much touch-up work did you have to do on that one? Mm, I made him. I made him about ten years younger. I did some skin softening. No, I just just kidding. Um, I don't know. He took a some pretty good bites there. There was like a up in here. There was like overexposure coming from these buildings up here. I had to. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but above his hat, I had to, you know, paint over that and tone down some brightness in that white stuff. But that was that was about it. Uh, I think he uh, had a good ex good expression, happy to be in the Big Apple, enjoying his soft pretzel. And I was down in Nashville one day on 20th Street South, outside of. Nashville and I just saw this cute young lady in a hat and carrying her pet pig around and I thought that would make a nice picture so I asked her if I could take take her picture and she was happy enough to oblige so that was nice and we're gonna go through hopefully y'all can stay awake here the 
history of some of the most famous street photographers of note, uh, Henry Cartier-Bresson, the French street photographer famous for the decisive moment, founding member of Magnum Photo in 1947. Um, it is rumored, um, you can jump in there if you would do that, it is rumored he liked that scene right there and wanted to catch a person walking uh, with nice fashion or something or whatever came through that opening and he waited there for three hours to for someone to come into the scene that he liked. How many of you would wait three hours to make a street photography, uh, street photo? Uh, that, so some, we'll talk about the different styles, but you can chase people or wait. And he did some serious waiting to get that famous shot. Uh, Helen Levitt, there was children that did chalk drawings on one block during the summer and she just documented that and is famous for uh, a lot of those photos. Uh, Robert Frank, I think he's in the 40s and 50s. You know, it's, it's pretty cool that they were all using black and white film and film cameras. And um, yeah, he flew in the face of the wholesome pictures like Life and Time Magazine and he thought a photograph should have a point of view so he did more of gr gritty type photos. And 1890s to 1920, a French photographer, uh, Eugene Adje, the first to document the streets of Par Paris and he photographed uh, a lot without even having any, see, you know, if you don't wanna if you go to a big city, you can do a lot of architecture, stairs, gardens, and windows, and not even if you're intimidated by, you know, shooting people and then catching you taking their pictures, you can do other things like that. 1920s, Berenice Abbott took a similar style to Eugene Adjet that we just looked at, but he used it to document the city of New York and I guess so. He had a lot of photos of him. I just, I thought this was a good early representation of street photography. Oh, this, this cracked me up. Now I've thought about doing this before and I went, no way. Uh, this guy, 1938 to 1941, New York City subway series. He took a contacts camera and strapped it, had a strap and he, strapped it inside his coat to his chest and had a long shutter release down his sleeve and he would take pictures and nobody knew what he was doing so Caught. hey richard yes is that walter evans or walker evans i don't know if i had a a typo or not Let walker me... evans was a famous uh, farm security administration photographer i don't know if he ever did anything in new york he may have um, unless I did a, a typo, but check it out and post dag, something dag, later. Oh, dag on it. You're right. I did a, yeah, the, uh, L is right by the K on the keyboard, as you might note. And, uh, that is supposed to be Walker Evans. Yeah, but the T isn't. Walker, I'm, I'm all, Walter. Out, all out of whack there. I got one, I got one letter wrong, uh, T instead of a K. Sorry about that. It is Walker Evans. William Eggleston, uh, I know for people that want to do street photography where there's no people in the frame, he uh, did photographs where no people were in the frame, but their presence was suggested by the subject matter. This was Gary Winogrand, a good example of emotions in a photograph. This is one of his more famous ones. I know Gary Winogrand used a Leica with a 28 millimeter lens and he got within uh, 
usually less than 10 feet, usually about six, eight feet away from people at the 28 and still filled up the frame. So he was a one that shot close. So Richard, I have one quick question. Would you yes. say that um, street photography is more about capturing the essence of people uh, and, and their interaction or just like this candid moments, that type of thing, as opposed to necessarily uh, the, the architecture or environment? Um, would you say that it's more about people and who they are and capturing a moment with people? I guess that's what I'm curious about as far as street photography and how it might differentiate. Because I look at a lot of these and they're really a lot about, and a lot of your work too, is, is about um, the individuals that come through the photograph that make the photograph. Yeah, I mean, I try to choose a good background and I may wait I don't have as much patience as some people. I've waited like 40 minutes for someone interesting to come through when I see a good background. But um, yeah, I try to you know tell a story about the person. But you know, there's some people I know that in, in Columbus, it's you know they found, find a triangle of light and just wait for a person to walk through as a silhouette and the shadow and it's considered fine art and it's not about the person at all. It's about the triangular shape and silhouette, wet and shadows. And so, you know, there's different styles. You know, the more modern popular magazines as seem to be getting away from pictures like this that show emotion and people and uh, humanity and more about fine art and uh, the shapes and architectures and shadows. So uh you know uh, i just saw that the other day someone posted on one of the the threads that you can post your street photography on are we getting away from humanity and and uh people in the photographs and are we going to fine art on everything and he seemed to be frustrated because his his photographs are of people in humanity and people that are getting the premier spots and were about the, the shapes and the shadows and fine art and people were, were just secondary. So, you know, it depends on your style and, you know, I still go with the old school style, but there's an emerging fine art. It's not a good photograph unless you, a person is a silhouette with a yellow triangular shadow shape and red, red and blue in it too. And, and, you know, person's just a silhouette. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. There's a old, old school and new, new style is probably the best way I can answer it. Richard, there's a lot going on in this particular picture. I mean, if you look it over and I, I, I can't help but think that the context of where that person is, at least to some degree, makes a big difference in whether it's interesting or not. It looks on the side, almost like you've got a little bit of a restaurant or something going on over here. There's, I think there's a reflection to the, uh, to the right side, which may be the photographer himself. It looks like somebody's holding something up to their face. So a lot of times there's, there's many things going on, particularly when you got glass involved. And I, I think it found, finds it more intriguing as you look it over then. So it's, yeah. you, know, you don't know why she's laughing or uh, if she was with somebody or, or just you know, what, what the context is there, and that leaves a mystery to it. But it does. What there's, I'm there's looking no, at is, is, is that there is actually a lot there that you may not see right away. Right. I mean, they didn't have cell phones back there. She didn't just get off a call. It's like yeah. what, made her, what made her laugh hysterically like that? Is there a person right out of the frame, maybe, probably, but, or she just thought of something and started laughing hysterically? It does make you wonder what was going on there yeah but anyway donna i don't know if i answered your question at all are you there donna oh well. i didn't unmute i gave you a thumbs up yes thank you very much <laughs> okay this is 
Lee Friedlander, uh, another famous New York photographer. You know, people going going in and out. Yeah, I mean, there was 50, 60 examples of his work. I just chose this one. thought it was kind of interesting. This is Joel Meyerowitz. I think he shot like in the 60s and 70s, um, 80s. Well, he's still still alive and see some of his shots today, but um, he did a lot in color where you see most of them black and white, but he was, he didn't mind using some co color in street photography, which is rare for the famous street photographers to actually use color. I thought this guy's notes was, were kind of interesting. Tony Ray Jones learned from Winogrand in the 60s and went back to London to do street photography and he made some notes about street photography in his personal journal. Be more, there's, there's, be more aggressive, be more involved, talk to people. That's, uh, yeah, you, you know, Dick Wood, it's been out with me. I know that, uh, you know, you gotta be smart about who you talk to. I can tell someone who I shouldn't be talking to from about 80 to 100 feet away coming towards me and sometimes I'll cross, cross the street and they at a 45 degree angle and jaywalk and they start jaywalking at a 45 degree angle towards you and then I circle back and 45 degrees the other way and finally lose them. But when they're trying to track you in the same way, you know, they just want to ask you for money and bother you and stuff. So <clears throat> you have to be careful. Uh, stay with the subject matter, be patient, take simpler pictures, see if everything in the background relates to the subject matter, vary your compositions and angles, be more aware of composition, don't take boring <laughs> pictures, uh, get in closer, use a 50 millimeter lens for possibly less in the picture. Now, most people think a 35 millimeter is perfect to take in enough of the background. Yeah, sometimes you want to get in closer and take in less. Watch camera shake, shoot at 250th of a second or above. Don't shoot too much. I used to shoot, you know, everything that moved first year I started. Now I'm selective and I, you just know what you want to shoot and you don't you don't bother and walking around an hour, I might take, you know, four or five, come across four or five situations where I take a picture in an hour. So sometimes you get nothing and a lot of times I'm out for an hour and I'm going back to my car and about five steps from, you know, getting in my car and uh, someone comes along that's one of the best shots you've got in the last year and you're about to <clears throat> give it up and you're all all mad and disappointed. Uh, don't Richard, shoot it. I'm sorry, hey, go Richard, ahead. Yeah. Richard, this is Eric. Have you ever paid anybody to take their picture? I'm just curious. Yes. Okay. How do you feel about that? Or talk about it, I guess. That <clears throat> guy that was playing the trumpet and had the, Okay. you know, he said, I said, do you mind if I take your picture? And then, you know, he played a song and I took a couple snaps and listened and then, uh, you know, that's a little bit different of situation. Yeah. So you were playing <clears> for the music too. I'm kind of playing for the music and the entertainment and for, and for taking the picture. Okay. But al <clears throat> along those lines, there are con artists <clears throat> that will ask you, can you take my picture? And after you take the picture, they they say, well, that'll be 10 bucks and you know, and then they step in your face and you're, yeah, you're in a bad situation then. So you gotta, mm -hmm. gotta, gotta be careful. Uh, don't shoot all at eye level. Um, we'll go over that some more, but you know, you can put your camera up high, chest level, waist level, knee level. And every once in a while, I try to remember, you know, try to put the camera down 
by the street and point it a little bit up gives a unique perspective. So I don't know why this guy said that. No middle distance shots. I don't. I don't know. Sometimes middle distance shots are still good, but that was his opinion. Richard, one of, Richard, one of your points was keep it simple or make it make it simple. It's up above there. Take take yeah. simpler. What is, what is, what does that mean to you? Take simpler pictures. Yeah. That's, you know, maybe, well, maybe it goes along with um, down here, get in closer, use 50 millimeter lens for possibly less. It might go along with that. I'm just guessing really um, weren't my notes. I don't know what was in his head, but I'm, I'm thinking instead of taking in so much of the background and, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, people too will just take picture of somebody's bow tie without even their face, a bow tie and the jacket they had on and they're holding their arm up with just a certain type of watch and they just take a simple picture like that that takes in the style of the of the day where you're not taking in all of the background. It, he could have meant something like that, I'm not sure. Now this, that guy that just took down those notes, he went back to England after studying here with street photographers and took this picture, I don't know, a catering company and you get food in the background, sit down and somehow there's a horse horse wandering around free and uh, the guy's getting up because the, the horse might have been sniffing his shoulder a minute before that or second before that. It's kind of <clears throat> kind of weird, kind of interesting. And I know that some of you have seen the movie about Vivian Mayer. She was born in New York, but then moved to Chicago and she was a nanny for 40 years and first walked around with the roll of flex and then a, a Leica towards the end of her shooting. But she was a recluse and had like mounds of newspapers, never threw away for, newspaper for like the, the last 10 years. And you could barely walk through her place. There's a, a little aisle between the newspapers where you could walk. And uh, after her death, they found thousands of rolls of film. And there's a fight over. Uh, they're just fantastic street f photos of Chicago over 40 years. And uh, there's a big fight about the property rights to all her film and her photos. And some of, some of you see that film. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. I would, I would recommend it. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Love Vivian Maya's work. I absolutely love her work. Yeah. Capture the essence of New York City. Who are you talking about, Vivian or Jay Maisel? Uh, both, but in different different ways. Okay. Vivian was more black and white, and the people. He's more graphic oriented. That's just to me. Yeah, you're right. So I don't know. Jay Maisel came. I was surprised to learn he died in 2019. But, uh, you know. He uh, a Midwest photo actually brought him over and he did a presentation about 10 years or so ago. Yeah, I went, I went to that. That was, you took the words out of my mouth. I think I might have seen you there, but. I was surprised. He, somebody asked him what kind of equipment he used. He used a DSLR and uh, like a Tamron 28 to 300 zoom lens. And everybody's into their, you know, Leicas and their 28 or 35 millimeter primes. And he said, you know, I like to be able to reach reach across the street if I need to, or far away if I need to. Or he had wide angle. I just. <clears throat> Has any, anybody? Uh, um, what does the D stand for in DSLR? Oh, digi digital, digital. Oh, okay. um, they were film cameras were just SLRs. And then uh, when it became dig digital uh, sensor, I started calling it that. But uh, yeah, he used a lot of color in his photos and he's in the street photographers hall of fame and so forth but uh 
you know, <clears throat> most of his photos are during the the daylight if you uh, try to use a f-stop of like 4.5 to 6.3, you can't get good shots at night, so you'd be confined to do street photography during the day. And I'm sorry that my, I talked on the phone all day long, so my voice is wearing out. Um, <clears throat> Diane Arbus, she did photos of the fringes of society, the men mentally ill, transgender, and circus performers, and had some interesting shots. Uh, Richard? Yes. Technically, technically, that is Deanne Arbus. She pronounced her name Deanne. Deanne? Okay, yes, thank you. Purists. Like okay. myself. Okay. Thank, thank you. You probably know the history of this better than I do. Um, Jamal Shabazz from New York. He did a also did a bunch of photographs on the New York City subways and is famous for hip hop, the emerging hip hop culture. And he also did about 10 years worth of every gay pride uh, parade in New York City. And there's a book of his photos of that on that as well. And some of you all have probably heard of what some people think is the obnoxious Bruce Gilden. He's the one that will jump out in front of you with a flash gun and he, he takes pictures from like three feet away and blasts people and a lot of people have, you know, pushed him and punched him and whatnot. But uh, he's a in-your-face photographer is his style. Hey, Richard. Yes. You know, most of the great photographers are from New York and Brooklyn. <clears throat> I noticed that. Just saying. You're just you're just saying right, Brooklyn boy. Uh let's see. <clears throat> yeah, I know. I I found that I mean, you struggle in the short north to walk around for a couple hours and maybe get one one, two if you're lucky if you get one decent shot in New York, every street corner there's somebody new and interesting doing something. So it's just an amazing place, that's for sure. Is it is it legal? I'm not I'm an attorney, but I'm not gonna bore you with this too much. Yes, in a public place there's no expectation of privacy. If anyone can see it, you can shoot it. Where you can't photograph where it's been prohibited by law, like on some New York bridges after 9-11, they put up signs. They, they didn't want people taking photos off, hanging off the side of bridges, taking pictures of the uh, how the bridge was structured so they could try to blow it up later or something. So there's places where you're not allowed to. Sometimes around courthouses, as I've heard stories of some of our people were stopped by police asking what they're doing, taking photos, even though there's no signs. They tried to get people to stop taking pictures anyway. I have a quick question about that. Um, yeah. One thing I'd read or heard, and, and again, I, I don't know. I, I was at a festival one time, and um, it was inside a building, but it was a festival. And so inside the building, there were these things going on, different performances. And then there were things, people wandering around outside. I had heard a, um, a kind of a, a thing where you discriminate between whether something is inside an enclosure or outside an enclosure. But again, this was a festival um, and, and I took some photographs and one was a kid with his parents and another was a guy. Uh, and both of them I, I've exhibited places, but certainly don't have any kind of model release or anything like that, but they were taken inside a building. Is there any difference there between inside a building or outside a building, even though it's a public type of event? Oh, I think the what you can't publish in the next section, did the subject of the photo have an expectation of privacy? Um, you know, you got to ask that question. So 
um, I think it since it's a public fair and so forth, there's I think you're it's my opinion, people may differ. I think you're okay inside, but if you go people have an expectation of privacy in a in a restaurant and they're in a booth and they're you know, tucked all the way back back against the wall and trying to, you know, have some privacy and so forth and you taking pictures of them in there. Uh, you know, to me, I see some street photographers take pictures inside of grocery stores. I don't do that. I think that's bad form. I think you should have privacy when you're shopping in, in stores and so forth. But in your example, a public fair, I think you'd be okay. Uh, does anybody else have any opinions yeah, on that? Something? Can I add something? It's Paula Dalton. Okay. Um, I've heard that if there is an admission charge, it's no longer public. They can ask you to stop. Now, I, I don't know the legal ramifications of that, but I know people got in trouble at um, the Gahanna Creekside Festival. They were told to stop, and there was a, a big thing at the fair last year if you didn't already have a permit. And I've always taken pictures at the fair. Yeah, I've always taken pictures at the Ohio State Fair as well and not had a problem, so I but, mean. Yeah, I've been told if there's an admission charge, it is no longer public. I don't know if that's true. Um, I, don't e I don't either, to be honest with you. I think if there's something on the ticket about it, you know, on the back of it, you know, cam cameras and photographs prohibited. Uh, they would have some standing, but just telling you with nothing printed about it, it, you know, I don't. But again, if a police officer is telling you to stop taking photos, I take, I stop taking photos. So it's probably a case by case basis on that about how they want to enforce things. This is Jim Merzikowski. I was at the State Fair, I believe it was last year. Um, went there in the evening uh, to kind of take some night shots. And uh, because I had a tripod, uh, the Gestapo did stop me and had Gestapo. me pack, yeah, the Gestapo, had me pack up my gear. But other people were walking around, especially with cell phones, and taking pictures all they wanted. But I couldn't take with a, my digital camera. Yeah, it's it's varied on how they uh, enforce that. A lot of people. Does it have something to do with the intention, what use you're going to put the picture to? Uh, in other words, if you have uh, the motivation of making money, then it's not okay unless you have permission. Whereas if you're just going to show it to your relatives and maybe enter it in your club, it's okay. Is there anything along that line? Oh, since I'm an attorney, I'll kind of give you judges like bright line rules. It's either put your camera away or you can take pictures. They don't care what you're taking pictures of unless they see you taking pictures of children or something that raise their eye, but they, they don't have time to ask you whether you're going to publish it or try to sell it or anything like that. Just like you know, judges and divorce don't want to hear all the emotions of it. They split it 50-50, best, best interest of the children, and uh, move on, next case. I mean, they don't. I, so. I, I, I was I from, what I heard, from what I heard, and this is from a lecture, I think, Richard, you had a friend like 10 years ago come down from Toledo. She's a copyright attorney. Right. Is that you can take a picture of people on the street without, a, without a, anywhere and use it as fine art. However, when you start wanting to publish it, uh, not publish it, but you want to start using it for commercial reasons to make specific money, that's the problem. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah, that's been a, that's been a while. I don't know. If so how do you they, how do you get around that? I mean, what do you what do you end up doing? Because sometimes, um. You know, it's certainly like I had a couple of these photographs that I did enter into a competition, but certain things, competition outside of Westbridge, I didn't because certain places ask me, do you have a model release, this and that and the other thing. And I'm not quite sure what's required in certain areas or if you would even 
decide to sell. I, I've never tried to sell or put these photographs anywhere else because they were individuals. One was of a child. And so I just felt very uncomfortable with that myself. Um, the other was an adult, certainly, but, um, but just felt uncomfortable using it for any type of other purpose. But I don't know. Right. I think it's one of those things that, that's so, what do you do, you know, if you do want to, you know, there are all kinds of photographers all over the world that take pictures at different places of individuals or events going on and that type of thing, and they sell their photographs. But yeah, you can sell photographs with people in it, and uh, I don't don't do it that much. But um, you know, some things for competitions. There are things spinning around at the state fair with the the lights and the people are all blurred and um, or the people have their backs the one i entered in competition last year somebody last call for food and they have their back backs at the uh food uh food stand and all that but um you can sell pictures of people even with their likeness in it uh unless Wanna, that's the next topic here. Uh, you know, were they making a reasonable effort to avoid being seen? Is the is is the picture embarrassing to a person they could sue you? And the next thing, putting them in a false light make makes them look bad and uh, might be more likely to get sued, implying something untrue about a person and a, a background uh, something dicey and then you know person is in front of that and makes them look like they're going into a dicey place or something putting them in a a bad light that that wouldn't be good you could get sued but um and misappropriation and if you know if a person's not famous you can sell their picture without their permission but uh somebody famous like we have a uh, example i think you're coming up but famous people you have to get their permission you can't their likeness has value and so you can't sell something that already has value they get paid for their picture and commercials and so forth and at last when i did this presentation six years ago i had more about other countries and i looked and you know france and germany and you know, France, it's illegal to take a photo of a person without their permission. If you want to publish it, you have to ask for their permission and usually get a, them to sign something for each specific usage. And every every country, I wasn't going to take a half hour to go what you can do in France and Germany and Canada and so forth. If you're taking a, going, a trip to another country, um, go ahead and look up what their, what their rules are before you go there. One of the problems you can run into is street photography that actually would be where you would get sued is logos. You got a logo in it, you better take it out. You've got Coca-Cola in there. Um, they defend their logos to the death. And yes. if they find something published that is using their representations that they already have copyrighted, they'll come after you then too. So that's not the thing you think of. I mean, you see Coca-Cola everywhere, but yeah, don't make it part of your photo. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I didn't even think of that. And I did a, I lived down in Nashville there, took a jaunt down there for three years to left to work for a company and they liked me and let me come back and work out of my home. But while I was down there, this band hired me to take a picture of them for a for an album cover and uh, set up my six flashes and a old, leaning up against an old car and a railroad track and the way in the background is <clears throat> excuse me it's called the batman building in downtown and uh nashville and it has big at&t logo at the top and uh i gave them the uh the photo and they said Oop. i said what it all looks good but you need to blot out that at&t on there although they'll, they'll sue us for some kind of rights for uh, our a percentage of our album or something so uh that's a good point so i i blotted the at&t off the top of the 
the tower there and covered it up. So it's a good point and you gotta be careful. So the equipment to use, uh, street photography and, uh, so, you know, everybody's got different, different styles and different equipment, but the basics is, you know, using your eye and your brain and the more you go out and shoot on street photography, the, the more you can anticipate you see somebody coming 80 feet away that's interesting and got nice looking fashion on and you see the backgrounds of sometimes I see okay I like that store if they would walk and keep walking in front of that store four stores down I move down and get in position <clears throat> across the street and then they're coming in front of that store and I've got a 50 millimeter lens I watch for cars and go out in the middle of the street and shoot them between cars where there's an opening with a nice background. You have to, uh, you get better with, with time with anticipating, you know, interesting people and where you want them to be and moving. And good, good shoes, camera and lens, and comfortable, older, low key, dark clothing is a, heck I went, I always wear like, jeans and older clothing. I, last time I went to shoot downtown, uh, I wore khaki pants and a nicer shirt and a nicer hat and probably looked pretty preppier, a lot preppier than I usually do. And I took five feet out of the car and a guy says, excuse me for this is, you know, I can't help but saying, I'm just repeating what the guy said. He is F you white man. And I said, and this is another thing, I, you just, you learn not to be com combative. I was just like, okay, and you got to think to yourself, well, F me then. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he said, I, you know, I hate Trump. And I said, oh, okay. All right, then. And he, then he said, you know, F, F you again. And I said, all right, all right, that's fine. You just walk walk away and make sure you're not pulling anything out on you. But there, I, I guess my story is I think I drew attention because I was wearing too nice of clothes and instead of my older ratty clothes that I usually, you know, blend in. It's like if you're coming in and preppy clothes, you're coming into their territory where they don't have as nice of things and stuff. And as I think some of them might get offended, actually. So any camera will do. You know, film cameras, DSLR, mirrorless, point and shoot cameras, range finders, phones. Traditional lenses are 24 millimeters, 28, 35, and 50s. Like I said, but I gave the example of Jay Maisel used a 28 to 30. And I don't, I don't know, Donna, if I can uh, take it off this presentation in a second and hold up a few cameras that I have. So what I do, just go stop, stop, share, and hold up a few cameras. I think you can, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just do that. All right. Am I bigger on the screen now? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll go through the period of time here. So this is a, this is, I don't know if you can see it at all there. Oh, I have to hold it up. That is a 1952 Zeiss camera folder. It's super, super skinny and you can uh, put it in your pocket. It's, it's made out of real metal. So this little camera here weighs like four pounds. It's like a brick. Um, but you push, push a button and the, the lens folds out. But anyway, I'll hold it up. You cock the lens, cock the lens here. I'll hold it up to my microphone and it's got a leaf shutter, so if you're on the street, someone's even five feet away, I'll press the shutter right now. Did you hear that? It, you heard it, it's the, I'll do it again. It's just the, you gotta wind it, wind it, wind it at the just, film on the just bottom. Just barely. Just barely, that's why. Barely, you, yeah, it's pretty quiet. I'm gonna put it like right up to the microphone and press it again, but. Anybody hear that? I mean, nobody, 
nobody can hear that on the street. There's no, no way. So if you want to go old school, that doesn't have a meter. So you have to use the sunny 16 rule or carry a light meter in your pocket and uh, meter or some, a lot of uh, cell phones have light meters on it now and you can point to where you see somebody's going to be 80 feet you know, away ahead of time and you set, set the settings on your camera manually real fast and shoot it. But that's an example of nobody can hear that. This is a Nikon old film camera from the 80s with a 28 millimeter lens on it. And as opposed to that last camera, uh, it's a little bit louder, but it's not, not crazy loud. Could you all hear that? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like impossible to see, but if you want, you can of course put this up to your eye and focus with this. And there's a prism inside and you can, you know, focus by using the printed prism to get things to line up or there's markings at the top, like it's on F8 right now. And if I put, you know, it at 10 feet, then it shows at like at 10 feet on, on top, it shows to the left, it shows a marking F8. It shows it's in focus from five feet away. And over here, there's a, on the other side, F8, it shows it's still in focus at like 18 feet away. So it's, you know, if it, without even putting this up to the, to the eye, you know that anybody from five feet away to about 18 feet away is it going to be in focus. But of course, at 10 feet, which is right on top, it'll be the most in focus. So this is if you want to shoot from the hip with a film camera and not even look at people, you can get a whole scene in focus and they don't know you're taking their picture at all. And then of course, when I went, as opposed to that, I went to New York and I walked around with Dick Wood, took us on the tour and there's the 28 to 70 lens on this Nikon D810 and people in New York were so into what they were doing and just about everybody had headphones on with music going and looking around at all the taxis and hubbub and other people they don't this makes well turn it on this makes well of course it's in in the dark here I'd have to change the settings off at f8 but it's still I mean it's it's louder but still I had no problem in New York and I just kept this down on my hip down on my across my arm like that and was talking to Carol Ter Carol Sherlow and whatnot I had it on you know zone autofocus and just picked up the closest thing to you if a bunch of people are going and it takes takes the picture or if someone was across the street I would change it to a more defined autofocus like group autofocus where it would it picks up like two or three people in a group, but uh, you know, but still you walk all around all day with a big DSLR like that. You're going to, you're going to feel it. You're back and you are more noticeable. More people do notice it, but you use this Nikon in the short North, everybody notices it and you can't be inconspicuous at all. But in New York, people really don't, don't care. They're so busy. Um, and I picked up this Fuji X, X-T2 um, only about four months ago. And it's, I mean, it weighs only several, several pounds. It's a 50 millimeter lens on here. I, I had a 23 at first, which is a, it's a 35 equivalent. And then I found you know, talk about comfort levels in the short north, you'd have to get like, to fill up the frame, you'd have to get like eight to 10 feet, oh, ten, eight to 10 feet away from people always to fill up a documentary style, style picture. And uh, for me, that's too close. I like to be about 12 to 14 feet away. So the, because uh, people are hyper aware in the short north and you get within seven or eight feet 
of people and uh, raise your camera at all, they look at you, immediately look at you and notice you're taking the pictures. So you shoot from the hip and 12, 15 feet away, you're good. I flip this screen out in the back a lot and look straight down at it and shoot from the waist so I'm not making eye contact with them and uh, get get away with more when you're not not taking it up to your eye and point pointing it at them then they surely notice and this is well I'll put it on if you want to take machine gun this is you can you can hear that but uh, um, if you want to take take some action shots with this you surely can but that is on the shutter sound, but I'm not gonna take the time, but this Q button here, I've got a setting for electronic shutter and you turn on electronic shutter and there's absolutely no sound that comes out of this. They don't hear anything, so their ears don't perk up and they don't, they're less likely to know you're taking a picture. But one thing with <clears throat> electronic shutter as opposed to mechanical shutter, electronic shutter when you're panning, you all have probably heard of the rolling shutter where the first couple of shots you take, there's a big, big curve in the photos and everybody's distorted and that it doesn't all line up vertically till you get like that one shot I took on the bicycle, mm -hmm. uh, that panning, that interesting guy at, with the hockey skates, you know, the first couple I had it an electronic shutter. There was a, a curve in it. And then when you're, he's right in front of you, there's no rolling shutter. And then when you go, go by again, there's some curves on this side and so forth. So um, some of you all might have electronic shutters and heard of rolling shutter, but if you have it in mechanical shutter, it, it doesn't do that. Um, so I have one quick question when you're yeah. planning with people um, and I guess I run into this sometimes even with bird photography when I'm trying to pan are you using a high speed continuous shutter or or what are you what are you on when you're doing that yeah I use continuous high speed or did you do a con burst continuous your... low I think okay. so continuous high is then? Yes, uh, continuous high is eight frames a second on this one, and continuous low is five five frames per second. So are you continually I, pressing though and doing a burst as you're panning with them? Yes. Okay. I do. Okay. I start. I start out about maybe like thirty thirty degrees from when they're going to get right. In, it's always best when they're right in front of right in front of you so you start like 30 degrees before they get to you and start shooting and i stop when they're about 30 degrees past me okay okay but their um yeah shutter speed is shutter speed is the thing you know that one was i got lucky with 160th of a second but Gosh, somebody really cruising like an Olympic biker, you you know, other people have probably caught it, people panning, you have to go up to like one sixty one sixtieth of a second to two fiftieth of a second. You really gotta get lucky to you wanna pan and have the spokes, you know, spin spinning and still see a little bit of the spokes and you know, stop action the, the person and have the background blurred. It's just like when you're shooting a World War II plane with a spinning propeller. It, I was saying, uh, you don't want a picture with a propeller stopped. You want it, the propeller blurred. And then if you have it too slow, you can't see the propeller at all. So it's really a trick to get it just right. And every everybody's moving at different speeds and you really have to get good at how fast they're coming and what shutter speed you should put it on. But anyway, back back to the presentation, I just wanted to talk about my cameras there a little bit. Anybody wanna say anything about their cameras and what, what they like? 
mm. what you shoot what you shoot with and all right well, I'll go back to the presentation here to finish up I hope so most people in street photography will say shoot it F8 and above, that's the traditional, but you know, some people break the rules and shoot at 5.6 and F4 and so forth, but to isolate a person instead of having everything in focus. And this presentation from six years ago said 1 20th of a second up and above for shutter speeds, but even at that, one twentieth of a second or one twenty fifth of a second. Um, you know, person's feet and hands will be moving when they're walking at a moderate rate. So if you really want to freeze their feet and their hands, you go up to two fifty. And like if they're walking the New York's pace really fast, uh, you know, you got to have three three twentieth of a second or above to stop people's hand and feet motion. But you might want that to be show motion, it just depends on what you want. And then when you drive it up to F8 and uh, a fast shutter speed, especially like 320th of a second, 500th of a second, you're gonna have, you know, 1600 ISO, 3200 ISO, even in the shadows in the day. So you're gonna have more grain in your photos, but I don't, people in street photography don't care, they'd rather catch the shot and have a little more grain. It looks like a old film photo anyway. So, and you can fix, fix a little bit of grain if you want. So that little bit of grain doesn't bother me. Again, uh, this is, I don't know, to be more conspicuous and cut down on the weight. A lot of people think you should take, you know, one camera, one lens, a flash if you need it. But, you know, if you're going to like that trip to New York once in a lifetime, I, I lugged around a bag with all my lenses. So, but like an everyday shoot in the short north now, I just take one camera body, one lens and keep it light and, you know, get, get what you can get within a certain range of your prime and move your feet. So there's zone focusing, uh, which can mean a lot of different things, but mainly it's you predict where a person's gonna be and uh, focus for that zone. And I showed you on my lens, <clears throat> especially on some lenses that have the manual settings, you can set, set your shed, settings for a certain you know, five feet to 18 feet away, every, everything's gonna be in focus and then you don't, don't have to worry about focusing at all with autofocus. And there's uh, autofocus and, you know, single point, it's a single point on autofocus. It's, uh, my, my screen jumped on me, but in autofocus, if you just have one point in the middle, it's hard to, you can miss people that way. It's better to have a little wider a uh, wider number of points to catch a person um, in the auto. And I talked about fo focusing manually. You can see a person's going to come by a, a telephone pole and focus on that telephone pole and, you know, that ahead of time and not have it on autofocus and you're going to get them pretty well in focus. Any questions about that? Uh, composing, we already talked about it, you know, normal is from the eye, from the hip, street level, from up above, it's, I don't do this enough as I shoot from the hip mostly and uh, I need to shake it up more often to give more variety to my photos would be better. We talked about this too, finding shots. Some people use a little bit of all, but some people are see a nice backdrop, a nice architecture, and they want to have a nice architecture in the background and get in a position where like that 
Henry Henry Cartier Brisson did on those steps with the wrought iron. Wait till that bicyclist come through there. Uh, so you can wait. Some people will wait for an hour or two for a nice shot, and some people hunting is just keep walking and you run into what you see and you you take what you see when you're when you're going. And some people <clears throat> stop and ask, but the more you ask, the more you don't get shots. They, a lot of, I'd say like 80 or 90% of people you ask say no. So you're better off taking the photo. And if they object, I know this, it's kind of weird. You're kind of a stalker when you're out there a little bit and so forth and taking, taking these pictures. I don't know. I've been doing it for like seven years now and it, I don't know, it doesn't bother me, but uh, I would say when you first go out, you might want to go out and group of five, five or six people and whittle it down to, you know, a couple or three. And then finally, when you're comfortable enough, you know, go, go out on your own. But it takes a while to build up the confidence to get close enough to people and sneak around and take pictures and learn the technique where they don't notice notice that you're taking the the photograph. I know it. Uh, like I said, my wife calls me the the stalker, but uh, anyway, it's something I enjoy. So I don't know how to explain it, but I think it's fun. Um, interaction with people uh, for candid shots. A lot of times, I avoid eye contact. I flip out my screen and look down on it, and I'm act like I'm piddling with the settings on the top of the camera when I'm really taking the picture. I know one good street photographer in the short north that walks through and he looks like he's taking a video. He's panning the camera back and forth and then we'll go up where he's not really taking a picture and then down and he's not taking a picture. And then when he, then he, when he puts it in front and snap the electronic shutter, it's, snap, 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 and he's taking their pictures and he acts like he's taking a video again. That's his, that's his trick on how to get pictures and people don't, don't know what he's doing. Uh, I've never tried that. It seems a little awkward to me, but again, avoid altercations. If uh, that one example, if I would have said F you man back to the guy, uh, that's what you don't want to do. That's how you, that's how you get hurt. Just bite, bite your tongue and move on, even if people aren't being nice to you. And if if you're con confronted about you're caught taking a photo that somebody didn't want and objects to it, just show them the camera and back back of the camera, show them you're deleting the photo. But if, if it looks like somebody that might want to steal your camera, if you get too close, tell them that you deleted the photo and don't get too close. You have to be careful. Yeah, like I said, with with experience, you'll see trouble coming your way. And most of the time I don't, I mean, that's the first time I had somebody treat me badly in about like five years. Most of the time it's just panhandlers asking for money and they might be a little drunk or something. You just see them coming and stay out of their way. Uh, uh, Richard, what, how has the COVID yeah. situation affected your shooting? Uh, well, I wear I wear a mask. I do, you know, closest I get is the COVID situation is maybe 15 or 20 feet. So I'm with all, in all the guidelines. So, you know, with that in mind, I masked up and keeping my distance. I don't, you know, I don't go in places i just stay out in the fresh air on the street so following the guidelines it hasn't really affected me too much to be honest with you but you know i go out there and i you know i'm one of the advocates for wearing a mask and i am amazed when i go out in the short north of about half the people will be wearing masks so it is not not well followed and it frustrates me so you have to 
you know, keep, keep your distance. Uh, any other questions about that? Um, what to shoot decisive moments. That's Henry Cartier Bresson. This is a, seems like most of the time I go street shooting, it's with Richard Wood. We were walking up and I heard a bunch of commotion. I had my Nikon DF, which I've traded. I had a, I think a 35 millimeter old manual lens. I set it on like 12 feet. I had the shutter speed on 320 F8 and auto auto ISO. And I just held my camera up, up over the crowd and took three snaps and one in the middle, I thought was a decisive moment when it's like, will he make it or won't he make it? That was the state fair. Yeah, what did I say? Yep, that was, was the state fair. So I don't know, you know, you talk about, will people object to a picture you took at the state fair? I mean, you know, who's gonna object about this picture? It's not, doesn't put anybody in a bad light. It's not offensive, I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't bother me. This decisive moment, a guy skateboarding on the street, and you know, will he will he make it? His landing up over that curb, will he? Will he not? He didn't. Richard, he didn't. aren't you an injury attorney? Uh, used to be. So basically, you're looking for clients in this shot. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, I used to used to chase ambulances. Now I'm too old and slow, so I don't anymore. That's my that's my old joke. But now now I work for a insurance company defending defending the insurance company so anyway this guy did not make it he landed awkwardly and fell fell a little bit sideways so will he make it will he not he did not um this is eh, it might not be the best example of a juxtaposition but this girl had on a really expensive black leather dress and there's a gal art gallery in the background and you've got uh, the homeless person in the bottom right <clears throat> begging for money so it's rich poor other ju other juxtapositions on the street tall short young old strong weak I'm sure you can think of think of some more uh, this is my granddaughter. I love this picture. Emotions. She was the Columbus Zoo. She was so happy. I told her for like 10 minutes, no, you can't go out in the rain and get all wet. No, you can't go out. And I said, all right, go, go ahead and I'll take some photos of you out, out in the rain. And there she is jumping up in the air with a big smile on her face, just having the time of her life. Let her, let her be a kid and let go. Of course, I heard it from her mom bringing home a soaking wet kid, but oh well. And this was at the protest after the George Floyd and this guy was just screaming with emotion. So Richard, on a shot yeah. like that, how close were you to that guy? This is Sue. Or did you have to crop the shot a little bit to get him to be such the focus of it? Yeah, I crop. I cropped about fifty percent, to be honest with you. I, I think I was about fifteen feet away. So, so okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now you can take, try to take some shots that are like humorous elements with the. Uh, graphical elements in the back and try to make it be funny and interesting and stuff. I didn't take this one, by the way. I just borrowed it as, a, as an example. I just took this during COVID and it might be more of a graphical element, but detail shots, it's just the times, please wait here. I was just waiting and just looked down and take took a shot of this. Um, 
uh, we were kind of talking about details before. It's shots of people's clothing and maybe the watch they're wearing. A lot of people take pictures of women with fishnet hose from the knees down and they got on fancy shoes and shadows off to the side. It's just, you know, close up details. And uh, these guys were in the short north just driving through <coughs> in the crowded traffic and they yelled at me, hey man, take our picture. So I did. And just an example of gestures. Uh, portrait in the short north, street portrait. This guy said, hey, take a picture of me. I'm the the best food delivery man in the city of Columbus. I said, you are, you are, so snap. So these are the, the end of the presentation. Um, where to shoot, short, short north OSU, Bicentennial Park, Scioto Mile, the railroad tracks are around there. It's kind of inter interesting find a lot of things with architecture and the planter boxes and brick houses. It's a different look in German village, Columbus Commons, festivals, state fairs, county fairs, Gay Street, Clintonville, downtown around lunchtime and downtown during an event, Arena District, North Market, the, the parks and that is it. So I've, Richard, do, do you uh, shoot uh, almost every day or what's your shooting regimen? Well, my goal is to picture, to post one picture on Instagram a day, which I've done for like two years in a row now, which uh, it's kind of hard to get a, qual a quality one every day. But so, yeah, sometimes they're they're better than others, but I shoot normally about two hours on Saturday and two hours on Sunday and once for about an hour and a half about Wednesday in the middle of the week. So, and if I walk out of, I used to get one, one shot on a quality shot on a Saturday and one on, I mean, uh, and one on Sunday. Now I can, you usually get like two, maybe three and, the same on Sunday, but the weeks where I only get one good one on Saturday and one on Sunday, I, I got to bolster things up on on Wednesday and try to get two or three to meet meet my goal. But it's a uh, it's a lot of work to try to post one quality of photo today a day. I've challenged myself to do that uh, two years in a row, and now you all have mm. seen seen them. And uh, like I said, I out of seven days probably get like four or five quality ones and you know a couple that are kind of better than it better than average but you know i still put it up there anyway if it's got some redeeming value but uh anyway that's what i do i think you forgot to add what a shoot is up for example rain and snow inclement weather sometimes cool uh that's that's true i i love shooting in the rain and snow and uh i bought uh an equipment other equipment is important i went to target and i saw a stack of umbrellas and it says won't turn inside out up to 30 miles an hour won't turn inside up out up to 50 miles an hour and then i saw the next the next one 16 dollars about four or five dollars more than the rest won't turn inside out up to 70 miles an hour. That's the one for me because that's the the pictures I'm trying to get is pi picture in the rain where people's umbrellas turned inside out and they're, everything's blowing sideways and there's hu humanity against the, the bad weather and um, umbrella blowing away that <clears throat> when I kid the, now that my umbrella won't turn inside out, I have to worry about being Mary Poppins that the wind's gonna blow me away but if I'd lose about 50 more pounds I might have to worry about that but I think I think I'm safe but uh, any more questions 
my, my experience with the street photography, it really just depends on where you are. Um, so many places, like say Short North is probably a pretty tough place to be and to actually get some decent shots. Um, I think I've done it a couple of times, but like you say, people, you can't pull a camera up and everybody's looking at you thinking, you know, yeah, this is my wife or this is my girlfriend or whatever, as if you're, yeah, you know, what are you doing here? It just is out of place. Same time, you, get, you know, when we're traveling, uh, you go to, it's like old Havana, Everybody's got a camera. All the tourists got a camera then too. So it's not a big deal. You just pull the camera up and take your shots. And uh, occasional time you'll get in tight and you might want to shoot from the hip, but it just depends on the environment that you're in. Uh, if I take uh, photographs on some of the back roads here and I'm out in a farmer's, you know, at the edge of a farmer's field, taking pictures, the sun setting or whatever, it's not uncommon for the farmer to show up. You know, all of a sudden there's somebody standing next to you and I said, what, what are you doing? What are you, you know, there, I've had that happen multiple times and you know, you're not doing anything but taking a shot from the side of the road. And so it's, it's very suspicious to a lot of people. You're just out of place. And I, like I say, it all depends. I think it all depends on where you are and whether or not a camera is being used commonly, or you're just sort of an oddity. They, they just wonder, one, they thought I was with the Farm Bureau or something like that. What are, you, are you checking this out or that? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> so it's just as interesting that too. Depends. Some places are great to do it. Other places are, are much, much tougher. Yeah, I, uh, I, I agree. The short north, uh, I mean, I'll go back to this one shot, this one, right, this one right here. I had the camera down at my hip with the screen flipped out and was acting like I was piddling with my camera and I could frame her up in the, in the screen that was down at my hip and, you know, watched and she was like looking at me. And then as soon as she turned her head to the side to look at something else, I, I, I clicked and I got her where she wasn't paying attention to me. You get better and better at watching and taking, taking at the more appropriate time. But, um, Flip screens are nice. Yeah. But, so that's the hardest to somebody walking right off. It's really difficult to pull pull it off and not feel like you're going to get caught when somebody's going from side to side, like the background. Um, it's so much easier. They're not. You find a nice background. They're going left to right or right to left. That's and it's an interesting background, and they're running or riding their bike or just walking. Have interesting fashion on you generally don't get caught but you're right the uh within 12 to 6 feet and they're walking right towards you your people are hyper aware you have to be really good not to get caught so oh any other any other uh, nice questions like that richard do you ever use your cell phone because it seems like nobody notices cell phones anymore because everyone's on them or does that not give you the quality of photo you're looking for? I don't, to be honest with you, I tried it before and uh, it's it's okay. I think my phone is eight megapixels and I don't know, it's hard, especially when people are moving. It, it, I mean, if it's a static environment, you're people standing around, you can do okay, but cell phones usually don't jack up the shutter speed. You're going to get everybody's going to be blurred if they're moving much at all. Um, but on my, I've got an app called manual and I can sit there and it's one of the, one of the ones where you can set the shutter speed and the manual and uh, uh, the uh, f-stop and so forth. And so there, there are ways to do it. And some people are really good at it, to be honest with you. And um, I don't know if on, on iPhones, I don't know if, a lot of you probably know this, but if you have a headset and there's a volume control plus and minus, if you have your camera application on an iPhone and you're, you look down like you're look, looking at it and you have the lens out with what you want to take and you push the plus sign on your, on your headset, it takes a photo and so you, don't even, you don't even have to tap the screen. You just keep pressing the plus sign on your headset. It looks like you're looking at the screen and listening to music and you don't have to lift up, lift up your thumb or anything. You just 
a little pressure on it and you're snapping photos and nobody has a clue. So I don't, I tried it for a while. I see people that just knew, use nothing but an iPhone and their street photography is fantastic. I've, I've just never gone there. Richard, have you ever uh, watched any of John Freed's videos out of Cal out of Los Angeles? I have not. He's a he's a street photographer. Uh, that's not his main job, but one of the side job or side photo things shoots he's done is taking pictures of hobos down at the railroad yards, and uh, the, some of the stories that he tells about these hobos, it, it's sad but amazing and uh he's done some great shots but he's on youtube john free f-r-e-e -E. okay well I'll, I'll check it out i i uh my first couple of years i found you know homeless people you know fascinating and uh took pictures and talked to some of them and uh give some of them money from time to time but that's not the main point of the story is that I don't know I'd, I'd post those and show people that and they people would turn their heads and I get a picture like this I, on the screen I might get a hundred likes on Instagram and I take a picture of a homeless person and get like two likes everybody not everybody but a lot of people are not fond of you taking pictures of homeless people they think it's exploitive and so forth. Um, I showed that picture of the homeless people walking across the railroad tracks earlier, and that's about all I'll do now. It it shows that they're homeless, but not in such a close-up way. I took one with a guy laying there, gorked out with his tongue hanging out sideways once, and posted it. And he's emaciated and oil, oil and dirt all over his face and arms and clothes, and just in a terrible state of repair and I got like two likes and I think one person even said you shouldn't post something like this this is you know unconscionable and so forth so I I don't do that anymore that John Free he actually still shoots he shoots with a Nikon film camera he still shoots film only that that would be good for uh, Mark Full, uh, who will develop he's an my. Interesting guy. I've watched my, uh, John Free's videos. And I heard uh, that. He's a very interesting guy. Um, I'll have to. I'll have him. to. I'll have to check it out. It's uh, if he does it in a certain, you know, I don't know if I want to use the word dignified way, but uh, I know in a certain way it. Could could be okay, but if they're, you know, sleeping with their tongue hanging out like I did on that one shot early in my street photography and career, I just found out. I'm not, I'm not talking about homeless. I'm just talking about as a street photographer. Um, he's just a very interesting guy at how he goes about things. He he would be an interesting one to to look up. I'll do I'll I'll do that. I, you know, when I started. Uh, when I started street photography, I probably watched like six YouTube videos, you know, sit up till two or three in the morning watching videos on how people do street photography. So I've got a obsessive compulsive uh, personality. So I could probably for like first two years of street photography, I watched at least three hours of videos on street photographers and how they did it and they're different composition and techniques and all that and tried to emulate them and so forth so you know it's a lot lot to learn about it and lots of different styles so how many you know i don't you know i don't think that many people in the club do street photography i would like to i know it's it's kind of a scary thing getting out there and taking a picture and worried about getting caught and so forth. I don't know, does, does anybody after watching this have a, more of an interest in it? I'm just curious. 
Well, I do have an interest in it, but I, I feel kind of creepy out there with the camera photographing people. Yeah. Kind of, like, I, like you said, you just have to get used to it. You have to get used to it. Like I said, my wife <clears throat> calls me the stalker. I just like, uh, I just like, like people I like, uh, it's just, it's actually relaxing to me. I do legal work for like eight hours a day, typing, typing letters and answering phone calls and sitting in a chair. I just, it's good to, good to get out and get some fresh air and see people and take, pictures of them doing things so it's just I find it totally therapeutic and relaxing so that's that's just me you just like I said the more more you do it the more you get used to it hey, Sue Sue sometimes Richard and I sometimes Richard and I go out and uh, I'll give you a buzz because we usually do on the on the weekend all right and uh, just go along and we'll throw you the wolves sure okay <laughs> You or know, I'll have to defend you too. And, and you know, I tra I travel some. We took Carol Stoller along, right? Carol, where's Carol? <laughs> Is Carol here? Carol went to New York with us and never did it, and she thought, yeah, I don't know, I survived. <laughs> and she was yeah. in Big Apple too, the big place. So people usually yeah. don't bite. That's all. Uh, you know, I'm more of a a Rick person. I travel a little bit internationally. And I think nothing of taking uh, shots on streets internationally <laughs> or different countries, uh, but I don't do it here. And I, that's a good question. Why don't I? So add me to your list. Okay, what we'll do is uh, we'll just uh, send a, uh, one of these days, um, yeah, an email out to you guys on the list server and we'll do that. So the other question I wanna ask Richard is on your post, when you post it on Instagram, um, what are your most popular posts and do they match the photos that you value the most? Yeah, well, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. I'll have to think about that for a second, but yeah, you can, you kind of get used to the type of photos that are popular and they're usually the ones that you think are going to be usually the one after experience, the ones you think are going to be good are the ones that get the most likes. You can, you kind of become a judge for yourself after a while. I put post it and I think, uh, I think I'm going to get about 65 likes on this and I'm usually within like five and then, I'm, oh, I like the way this person's dressed. It's their jacket's blowing back, the big snowflakes are coming down, and there's a cool tavern with black paint and big black windows and columns in the background there. They got black pants, a black jacket that's blowing back with a white shirt with black polka dots on it. Their hair is blowing back, and the big snowflakes are coming across. I'm like, this is a, this is a winner, and I get like 125 likes. I'm, I'm right. You know, you just you kind of get a sense for is it good or not some and sometimes you think it's good and you get soundly rejected and thrown out on your butt no nope, not as not as good as i thought it was so but yeah you kind of get a sense for what people are going to like after 5 or 6 years of doing it so i didn't answer every every <clears throat> specific kind but you just generally get a, get a sense for what's good. All right, any other questions out there before we end for the evening? No, and I appreciate Dick's suggestion. We'd, we'd be happy to get some more people to come out with us, so. I would love it if you guys would do that, maybe, um, set up a little event or a, a, an outing or something like that where people could go and shadow you. And sometimes there's a little more comfort in getting used to something when you're doing it with each other, when you're doing it with other people, at least a little bit. And it's interesting that John um, was saying he felt relatively comfortable doing that internationally, but less comfortable doing that here in the United States for whatever reason. You know, and I think sometimes um, just going out with a few people at first, at least, 
can break that ice and make you feel a little bit more comfortable. So I'd love it if you guys would think about doing that. You know, Deborah, uh, we'd, we'd love we'd love to. Okay. You guys think about it and let's get something out there. How's that sound? Yeah. Good. Uh, we've done it done it in the past a few times. It used to be fun, like after we did a street photography walk, we'd go to Schmitz or something like that and continue on with show each other some photos and have some camaraderie. It was great, but unfortunately we can't can't do all that these well, days. I, we, I know we're we're doing that when we go up to Cleveland this weekend, but a few of us um went up a few weekends ago and you know kept our social distance, did all that type of thing and and yet it was it's fun sometimes also to get out of your element of what you normally do and being with other people gives you the confidence to do that or the right. wherewithal to do that, the kind of push that you need sometimes. So, you know, I yeah. think there are ways we can figure that out and let's think about it. I have a, a niece getting married this weekend or uh, I can't go to Cleveland or I would go, but I was really surprised at how good Cleveland was for photographic opportunities. I mean, it's fun. They've, yeah. they've got waterways and ships and boats, barges and tugboats coming in and uh, all kind of, you know, old architecture that are good backdrops for people walking through. It's just... Uh, Let's think about that. So John, I going was, to kind of what, what you said. Let's just think about that and maybe we can get some things together where... Um, you know, you've kind of started the ball rolling here, Richard. <laughs> so let's see if we can kind of keep that ball rolling a little bit. And, uh, yeah, that'd be that'd be fun. Thanks for your time, everybody. Richard, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Richard. It was just it was so good to. Good to job, Richard. One of our club members share and all of that. It was just it was just really good. So appreciated everything you shared in the beautiful photography as well. Appreciate it. Sorry, my. My voice wore out, wore out from You're talking good. all day. You're good. Yeah. Thanks, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Seeing everyone. Good night, John boy. That's it. That's it. <laughs> you got it. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Any extra measure of compassion? Because he went out.